So molecular orbital theory picks up right where valence bond theory lets off. So if we look at a couple S orbitals here down at the bottom of the screen here, they overlap in this region. In valence bond theory, we only ever really consider constructive overlap. It's kind of like a, almost assumed and sometimes not even mentioned. Um, but molecular orbital theory kind of takes it a step further. So first off, uh, bonds still result from the overlap of atomic orbitals. So it agrees with valence bond theory in that one respect. So however, we're going to find that that overlap can be both constructive as well as destructive. So the wave functions can be both in phase and out of phase. Uh, in this case, both occur simultaneously, and it leads to the formation of both bonding as well as anti-bonding molecular orbital. And it turns out the constructive overlap is going to lead to the formation of the bonding molecular orbitals, which are lower energy, and the destructive overlap here is going to lead to uh, the formation of the anti-bonding molecular orbitals, which are higher energy. And so the idea is this. If you look at kind of wave functions and stuff like that, if we just kind of take the example of a sine wave... <clears throat> So if we just kind of take the example of a sine wave here. So a sine wave takes on positive values from 0 to pi and negative values from pi to 2 pi. But right at pi, the sine function equals 0. And when a wave function equals 0, we refer to that as a node. So if we take a second sine function here, so and superimpose them, plus lines up with plus, minus with minus. When this happens, we refer to that as being constructive overlap. We say that the wave functions are in phase. So, and the result is an amplified function that's roughly twice as big in every respect, uh, provided these were perfectly in phase. And again, from 0 to pi, it's still positive, And from pi to 2 pi, it's still negative. So that's constructive overlap. When that happens with three-dimensional wave functions here, so in this region, that's the same kind of thing happening. And it leads to an, uh, a larger uh, molecular orbital uh, where this region gets amplified where they overlapped. Simultaneously, however, we can get the same kind of thing happening with destructive interference. If we look at that same sine function yet again, So if we set up a second sine function to superimpose with it, and this time we're going to make it exactly out of phase, this way the positive portion of one sine function overlaps with the negative portion of another. So, and if you look, these are perfectly out of phase, and they're going to cancel each other perfectly. The result is you get nothing. So, and that's destructive overlap. When, uh, you know, elements of the wave functions that are in opposite phases, we say, in this case, opposite signs mathematically, so this is not charge, it's mathematical sign of the function, uh, they actually cancel each other out. So in this case, we'll see, uh, in the case of, of overlapping orbitals, it's going to create a node every time. So in the constructive overlap, again, is going to always lead to the creation of a lower energy bonding molecular orbital. The destructive overlap is always going to lead to the creation of a higher energy anti-bonding molecular orbital. In any discussion of molecular orbital theory, so it turns out the hydrogen molecule here is almost always the first example we'll talk about. It's the simplest, most basic example. Uh, and in general, we'll talk about diatomics, but hydrogen is always the first one we'll ever talk about, whether it be a, a general chemistry or organic chemistry context here. So for hydrogen, you have two hydrogen atoms. They each have an electron in a 1s orbital. And as those hydrogen atoms approach each other here, they can approach in phase or out of phase. So in here, I'm representing the phases with colors, so green and blue. Uh, one's positive, one's negative, and it's arbitrary which is which, but they're opposites. So in this case, we have two options then. So those 1s orbitals here can approach in phase. Both green or both blue would have been another option as well or one green and one blue, and they're going to be out of phase. Now, when they're in phase, this region where they overlap gets amplified, leading to this bonding molecular orbital. So in this case, this is lower energy. So if you're electrons, the best place for electrons to be would be right in between the two nuclei, and that's the region that just got amplified and becomes a very likely place for the electrons to be. And so when electrons get to be where they want to be, so that lowers their potential energy, kind of a uh, way of the world, right? If you let something fall to the ground, it's attracted to the ground by gravity, it lowers its potential energy in a physics kind of context as well. So same thing here. When those electrons get to be right in between the nuclei, and again in this bonding like orbital that becomes a very likely place for them to be, it lowers their potential energy. So it turns out according to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, with this molecular orbital having a much greater volume, that also lowers the energy, but that's kind of uh, splitting some hairs though. But technically just covered my bases. 
Uh, if we look at the dis destructive overlap here, again, up top, so in this case, they're opposite phase in this region where they're going to overlap. They're actually going to cancel each other out and create a node. So you'll find that your anti-bonding molecular orbital always has one more node than your bonding molecular orbital because the place where they overlap creates a new one with that out of phase or destructive overlap occurring. And this is higher energy. So if you recall, we said the, the best place for an electron to be would be right in between the nuclei. And if you look, that's where our node is. That's the one place you'll never find the electron. It's not allowed to be there in this orbital. And so that raises the energy as well. Uh, and again, according to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, this has a much lower volume as an orbital. Uh, and as a result, raises the energy. Again, just according to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Uh, we call this lower energy bonding molecular orbital the sigma 1s. So, and the antibonding usually gets this designation with an asterisk to designate it that it's antibonding. So and if we kind of look at an energy diagram going on here, uh, these energy diagrams can be a little bit confusing because they put atomic orbitals as well as molecular orbitals on the same diagram. So, but if we kind of take a look here, <coughs> before the two atoms have actually come together, what you have is electrons in these 1s orbitals. So when they come together though, those orbitals cease existing and what you end up having is the lower energy uh, sigma bonding molecular orbital and the higher energy sigma antibonding molecular orbital, that's what now exists in the molecule. Those 1s orbitals no longer exist. Uh, and in this case, because you have two electrons, according to the Aufbau principle, you're going to fill them into the lowest energy position first. You're going to stick them right down here in the sigma 1s. And so overall, your electrons get to exist at a lower energy in molecular hydrogen than in two separate hydrogen atoms. And that's why hydrogen exists as a diatomic. If you envision helium, so and helium is 1s2. So if you brought in two helium atoms, each with their two 1s electrons, then you'd have four electrons in the molecule, not just two. And having four electrons, you'd also have to put two in the antibonding molecular orbital. And that is why diatomic helium doesn't exist. So we often calculate what's called bond order here to kind of describe how strong the bond is. And the idea is that bond order kind of corresponds to single bond, double bond, triple bond, bond orders of one, two, three kind of a thing. Uh, in like a Lewis structure. And so in this case, like in hydrogen's case, we have two bonding electrons. So we don't have any antibonding electrons and you divide by two. Essentially it takes two electrons to make a bond. And we see that for hydrogen, the bond order is one. If we were to do the same kind of calculation for helium, and again, helium would also have two electrons up in this one, again, in this uh, sigma 1s antibonding molecular orbital. So you'd end up with, again, two bonding still, but you'd have two antibonding and lo and behold, your bond order would be zero. That's equal to them not having a bond at all. And again, that's why diatomic helium does not exist. It essentially doesn't have any bonds. So zero bond order, as the case may be. So it turns out, as long as you have any sort of positive bond order, that particular molecule has a chance to re actually exist. Uh, so if you actually took something like He2 with a plus charge, it means you're losing an electron. Well, the electron you'd lose would be in that antibonding orbital, and so you'd only have one electron in antibonding orbital, and you divide by two, and you'd get a half for your bond order. And it's not a full bond, it's like half a bond, whatever that means. Uh, but because it is a positive bond order, He2 with a plus charge here actually may exist. Now, one other thing we should talk about just a little bit here is this lovely diagram at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you have two separate hydrogen atoms, so as they get closer and closer together, you'll find out that as their orbitals overlap, so, and the electrons go down into this bonding molecular orbital, it lowers the energy up to a point. And that point here is the mean bond length here, 0.74 angstroms for molecular hydrogen. So, but as you get them closer than that point, you actually start getting significant nuclear repulsions, and those nuclear repulsions would raise the energy significantly. Uh, so there is a, a closeness, a perfect Goldilocks closeness, if you will. You want them close, but not too close. And that perfect closeness here, again, is that mean bond length of 0.74 angstroms in molecular hydrogen. That's kind of how we explain this diagram. Uh, the lowering of the energy is just the electrons going into the molecular orbitals. If you also notice, though, this difference in energy to where they're two totally separate atoms and where we have the mean bond length here, that difference in energy is called the bond energy. So, and it turns out, you know, it takes energy to break a bond, but you release energy when you form a bond. Now, along with hydrogen, we should also kind of take a, a molecular orbital approach to looking at pi overlap here. And if you recall, pi overlap is the sideways overlap of p orbitals depicted here. And again, that can be in phase 
or out of phase. So it turns out at your p orbital, you have a node at the nucleus right here. That's where the wave function of a p orbital goes to zero, if you recall. Uh, and so when they overlap sideways, if they're in phase, you're still going to have that node at right across the, the, the both nuclei, uh, but you won't create any additional nodes. But with the antibonding, not only do you have the node at the nucleus, but right where the overlap occurs here, because it's a destructive overlap, you create an additional node. And so once again, your bonding molecular orbital versus your antibonding, your antibonding always has one additional node. So and if, same thing with the hydrogen, you know, with the sigma overlap we saw. Here, you have a larger orbital. Also, the electrons are going to spend more time closer to the nuclei in the bonding molecular orbital. That lowers its energy, whereas in the antibonding, uh, there's that node there where would be the best place for electrons to be, so it raises the energy, and also there's less volume for the orbital as a whole. And if we look here, if you have two separate uh, electrons in p orbitals for two atoms coming together, so as they come to overlap sideways, you create that lower energy bonding molecular orbital, again, with constructive overlap, and you create the higher energy antibonding by destructive overlap, but with only two electrons, you're only going to be filling up the bonding molecular orbital. And so again, bonding occurs because overall the energy of the electrons is going to decrease as a result. Uh, pi overlap here is something we will definitely visit yet again uh, later on in this course when we start talking about conjugated pi systems. Um, but we're probably not going to talk too much after this uh, about molecular orbital theory uh, outside of this context, truth be told. So we've looked at molecular orbital theory in the context of a diatomic like H2. Uh, but we've got to take a look at molecules that have more than two atoms. And this is where molecular orbital theory starts to get a little bit stranger than it already is. Um, if we take a look at the description of water here, so valence bond theory, uh, just as a review, says that oxygen here, having four electron domains or a steric number of four, is sp3 hybridized. And that means he's going to have four sp3 hybrid orbitals, one to make the sigma bond with each H, and then one for each of the two lone pairs as well. So and that's what valence bond theory says. And those sp3 hybrid orbitals are roughly 109.5 degrees apart. With the lone pairs, it turns out it shrinks it down to about 104.5, uh, but still somewhere in that tetrahedral shape uh, for the electron domains. Uh, but the truth is, when you look at molecular orbital theory, so you're going to combine the orbitals of the oxygen atom and the atomic orbitals of the oxygen atom and the two hydrogen atoms, and it turns out you're going to create a series of molecular orbitals, and I've listed four of them. This is by all means not all of them, um, but these are the first four, starting with the lowest energy. So these are increasing in energy as you go up. So it turns out the lowest energy molecular orbital you're going to form uh, kind of looks a lot like it's just an S orbital around oxygen, truth be told. So, but this is where things start to get a little bit weird. The second one here, so you actually find that there is electron density spread out across the entire water molecule for this second orbital. So for the third one here, uh, you see that there's actually two lobes here. So there's a node right down the middle of this molecular orbital. So, but you can see that there's electron density on each half of the molecule. Same thing on the fourth, it's just looking at two different halves. In this case, splitting the water molecule uh, through the oxygen between you know between the bonds versus the lone pairs uh, but these are four different molecular orbitals these can all hold two electrons each and so this idea of just looking at you know hybridization like we did over here with valence bond theory where you can isolate each bond individually like that oh bond and that oh bond and things like that sort it turns out it's just simply not true when you get to uh, molecules with more than two atoms we find out that our idea that you know hybridization and and that we come with with valence bond theory actually just kind of falls apart um, Hybridization is really convenient for predicting bond angles, but it turns out once you get to more than two atoms in a molecule, we find out its shortcomings. Uh, all this lovely stuff in molecular orbital theory dealing with many atom systems here, or at least more than two, uh, you should kind of be aware of it, but it's not the most important thing of the world. The truth is when we look at organic molecules, we're mostly going to look at the bondings, uh, the bonds and stuff like that from a structural standpoint more in correspondence with valence bond theory and Vesper theory than we will from molecular orbital theory in most cases. And again, one of those examples where we will really focus on molecular orbital theory a little more will be with conjugated pi systems later on in the semester.